Good morning, everybody. I'm very honored to introduce Professor Francis Arnold today. Uh, Francis Arnold is the Linus Pauling Professor of Chemical Engineering, Bioengineering, and Biochemistry at the California Institute of Technology. Dr. Arnold pioneered directed enzyme evolution, for which she was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2018. She has pioneered and used directed protein evolution for applications in alternative energy, chemicals, and medicine. Directed protein evolution mimics and harnesses the power of natural evolution to create new and useful molecules in the laboratory. This approach has been revolutionary in enzyme engineering and has enabled many important applications in biology, chemistry, medicine, energy, and environment. Dr. Arnold was recently appointed to, to co-chair the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And uh, among many of her awards, Dr. Arnold has received the Charles Stark Draper Prize of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering in 2011, the U.S. National Medal of Technology and Innovation in 2011, and the Millennium Technology Prize in 2016. She has been elected to the U.S. National Academies of Science, Medicine, and Engineering, and was appointed to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in 2019. Dr. Arnold also co-founded three companies in sustainable chemistry and renewable energy and serves on several public and private company boards. She earned a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering from Princeton University and a PhD in Chemical Engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. The title of her talk today will be Innovation by Evolution, Bringing New Chemistry to Life. And I'm looking forward to listening to this very interesting topic. Uh, and very interesting talk by our speaker, Dr. Francis Arnold. Well, thank you, Sawas. And I have to say, I'm so disappointed that I can't be with you in person. So I decided to come anyway to my favorite beach before I head off to PCAST assignment in DC. So I happen to be on a sand dune just across Lake Michigan from you now. And I hope that the internet uh, cooperates here. So first of all, Congratulations to PME for assembling this world-class innovative molecular engineering program. Uh, I trained as a mechanical engineer, an aerospace engineer, a chemical engineer, uh, at, but all I ever wanted to be was, was uh, a molecular engineer, an, an engineer of, of proteins. Um, and. And, uh, you know, we all know that, that proteins are encoded by the DNA, right, that makes the amino acid sequence that gives rise to these marvelous molecular machines that in, in, in the ones that I'm interested in, the enzymes, which are the best chemists on the planet, responsible for all the chemistry of the biological world. And it was my goal to create new ones, to make things that were actually better for human applications than the nature had made. And of course, I learned very quickly that our profound ignorance of how sequence in codes function would make that a very difficult endeavor uh, because we still don't know today how that works, how to design a new enzyme, right? We can, we can read the DNA, we can write DNA, we can edit DNA. <laughs> We've seen that for the most recent Nobel Prize, but we can't compose it well enough to make something that's useful. So I set out to solve this problem and quickly turned to the process by which all this chemistry came about in the first place. And that's evolution. When you think about it, this powerful algorithm, and that's what it is, of, of mutation and natural selection, has given rise to all the complexity of the biological world, all the functionality through a simple process. And when you don't know what to do, go with the tried and true. And for me, that was evolution. Now, of course, that's kind of easy to say. And in fact, it's a design process that humans have been using for a long time creating new biological things with useful functions for thousands of years by choosing who mates with whom and who goes on to parent the next generation. So by artificial selection, we have created 
corn that feeds us. We've created things that give us comfort. We've created things that would not be here without human intervention. That poodle, for example, and the photograph is not even fit in the sense that if it got out in my neighborhood in Los Angeles, it would immediately be eaten. So it wouldn't live to reproduce, but it serves our purposes. And we have learned without even understanding DNA, much less searching for the, the understanding of how sequin encodes function, we have been able to create all sorts of biological entities and biological molecules breeding uh, antibiotic resistance, for example, through this process of evolution. Now, of course, in the past, in the farmyard and um, in, in breeding cats and dogs, the mechanisms for generating the underlying sequence diversity for evolution have been limited. So for example, worms go with worms, monkeys recombine with monkeys, but probably you're not going to mix the two and get anything functional or beautiful out of that. So we learned some simple rules for how breeding would work. But today, those rules can be expanded because we can read any DNA we want. We can write any DNA we want, which means that in the test tube, if one starts to apply evolutionary design principles to create new molecules, suddenly the rules become unknown and, and you can do all sorts of things that in nature would be, or in the barnyard would be difficult or useless to do. So this is Wolford. I introduce you to Wolford. It's my laboratory mascot, a figure from Photoshop. We do not make wolf birds in the laboratory. Uh, we recombine DNA, however, in the test tube from any species we want. And we can have two parents, we can have three parents, we can have 33 parents in the test tube, which is powerful, but also mind boggling because suddenly you have to become the breeder of molecules and decide what is a process that's likely to give rise to something functional or beautiful and hopefully useful. Now, before I tell you how one goes about doing that, let's just think a little bit about why one would want to do that. So now what we're going to do is free evolution or artificial selection from the constraints of biology, free proteins from having to support life. Right now, natural selection works on biology and the definition of fitness is how well does it support life and, and the propagation of the species. But now we can free that and explore what is physically possible or chemically possible, which means we can look at proteins that would have no natural counterparts. And I'll just point out that biologists think that they study a large space, but this space of possibilities is far bigger than everything that has evolved from the beginning of of life to today, and th that's that little green space relevant to biology, the space of possibilities, the universe of possibilities for future evolution is truly enormous. And I'll share those numbers with you in a minute. But out there, I argue that, you know, the cure to cancer and the solution to climate change, why maybe even the cure to death and taxes is out there but you have to find it. And on a time scale, that's pretty limited. So let's, let's think about the numbers here. It truly is a universe of possibilities, bigger than we can even begin to comprehend. And we've seen some pretty big numbers <laughs> in these presentations. Just for a single simple protein, 300 amino acids long with 20 letters in the alphabet, we have a space that's far greater than the number of particles in the universe. Even if you look at ways you can change a, a give a, an existing protein, there's already thousands of ways to do that for a single change in the sequence. And as you go to simultaneous changes, making two at a time or three at a time, we quickly <laughs> rises exponentially in billions of ways to do that. 
And I liken this problem, this enormous space of possible proteins to the to the uh, marvelous short story that Jorge, Jorge Luis Borges wrote about the Library of Babel, which was the library of all possible books. You could assemble, for example, uh, from the English alphabet. And, you know, most of those books are just complete gibberish, right? If you're just going to randomly assemble these sequences, they don't really have any meaning. Yet in that same library is the true story of your life. Well, in Borges's library, the librarians throw themselves off the balcony in despair of ever finding a meaningful sentence, much less a whole piece of literature. And it, without some thought, we too could be in that same place of finding, how do you find a good protein in this enormous space? Now, luckily, that, pro that problem uh, is not so hard because if you think about it, and people smarter than I and well before I thought about this problem and said, well, what are the products of evolution? And so that tells me something about the nature of the, what we call the fitness landscape in this space of possible sequences. And so John Maynard Smith said, let's consider the space of all possible sequence ordered in a particular way so that each protein lies next to its single mutant labors. And you can walk through this space one by one, just making a single mutation at a time. And he argued that if evolution is to occur, it has to be smooth in at least some of its thousands of dimensions. For me, as an optimization problem, what it means is that, this, that the fitness landscape has to be smooth in some dimensions, and therefore I should be able to walk uphill on this landscape. So if it looks like what you see on the left, if it's rugged, then mutations will send you into crevasses of non-function and you stop evolving. But we are the products of nearly 4 billion years of continuous protein evolution. So therefore I said, okay, it must look more like the figure on the right. And any fool can optimize on a space like that just by taking one step at a time, which means you can implement that with the tools that we had in the late 1980s, where you can take an existing meaningful protein that you can literally scrape off the bottom of your shoe. One of those pieces of literature and, and uh, Borges's library is, is on the bottom of your shoe. So that's what life gave you. And if you make a small number of mutations to the gene that encodes that, stick it back into cells, they will start making mutant proteins. So that's all easy. That's just molecular biology. And the hard part for the human being comes to identifying who is starting to acquire interesting properties. So that's was the technical part of the invention was to realize that we only had to screen a few thousand to find a significant fraction uh, of the space nearby and, I, and do it in a way that you could reliably measure the small changes you would expect to see from a single mutation. And if you do that, most mutations are deleterious. And in the old days, we threw those in the trash can. In the new days, they just go straight to machine learning algorithms. But I won't talk about that today, as interesting as it is. But you can find improvements if, if you don't ask for too big a change, feed that DNA back into the process and continue to evolve so that you have, uh, you're walking up that smooth new landscape. So here's what it looks like. We start with a native enzyme, a catalyst that does what nature has asked it to do. And then we ask it to do something new. And yeah, unlike, not, not too unlike people, they're generally less enthusiastic about doing something new. But we just crank on it, turn the crank of mutation and artificial selection and push it up the fitness peak. And in fact, that works really, really well. Uh, you can make enzymes that will work in your laundry machine, enzymes for DNA sequencing, for all sorts of industries, agriculture and textiles, and you name it, 
pharmaceuticals now use enzymes widely for chemistry. And all of that has transpired over the last couple of decades so that in 2019, I got the biggest accolade of my life when I got to appear on the set of the Big Bang Theory playing myself. I think you might recognize Kip Thorne and George Smoot there as well. I don't know if you've seen this show. It, it's kind of a silly <laughs> show about nerds at Caltech um, who went from being endearing graduate students to annoying faculty members lobbying for Nobel Prizes. So it's kind of a good idea that the show is over after 12 seasons. But I'll just point out, I was the only woman ever on 12 seasons to be asked to play herself. So I'm glad at least they got that one in there. And it was a lot of fun. I wandered down to uh, Warner Brothers Studios down from my house and wasted a perfectly good morning having fun doing that. And it turns out more people have seen me on that than any other venue. I also got invited to a pretty cool party in Stockholm. And by the way, if you ever get invited, you should definitely go. A lot of interesting people there. This is Donna Strickland, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics the same year that I got it in chemistry. And she's the third woman in history to win the Nobel Prize in Physics. So we're there grinning, playing with our chocolate Nobel coins there. And, and you, <laughs> uh, you might uh, laugh at that, but they don't give the gold medals to the Nobel laureates because Nobel laureates are notoriously forgetful. And they're having way too much fun. And some of us are forgetful anyway. And they leave their gold coins lying about. So they only give you chocolate ones to play with. And that's um, Donna and me just <clears throat> enjoying, the <laughs> enjoying the moment. But let me get back to science. What did we learn from doing these experiments? We and, and many other people who applied this same simple optimization process to enzymes and, and it was surprising at the time because people thought that you couldn't make enzymes do weird things because nature didn't want to do it. And of course, that's the wrong way to think about it. But they also weren't sure that, that you could get anything useful in a reasonable period of time. So uh, let me just point out that proteins can adapt by this simple uphill walk. The stupidest, simplest optimization strategy works because we are the products of such a strategy, and that you can make big changes in function with small changes in sequence. That was a real surprise. And finally, much to the distress of the would-be designers of proteins, many, many beneficial mutations that we identified, we and many others now, are far away from the active site of the catalyst. 20. 30 angstroms away. What does that mean? That means we can't even explain their effects. Maybe a twofold change in catalysis. That's a very small energetic difference. We can't explain their effects, much less design them, predict them a priori. So this challenge still <laughs> lies ahead for those would-be designers. But I, I argue you don't need to design when evolution works so well. And you can optimize enzyme function in real time. But what about innovation? I, uh, um, I guess about 10 years ago started thinking about this problem because I was extremely annoyed that the designers of enzymes could design something that does chemistry unknown in nature. And it was, I mean, the designs were terrible, but then with directed evolution could be reasonably good. And I got extremely annoyed at that. I said, wait a minute, why can't I evolve something? And, and the first thought was that, well, you know, an active site has to position multiple functional groups simultaneously to reduce the energetics of the transition state and and, and that would be too hard to do one mutation at a time. And then I realized finally about 14 years ago that, wait a minute, that is completely the wrong way to think about it. Why? Nature makes new enzymes all the time. So here was the problem. If you make a mutation, one or two mutations or three or four mutations, you pretty much have the same structure. We know that from protein science and from all the products of evolution. So how are you going to get 
something that really looks like its parent structurally to take on a whole new function. But nature does it. And the answer to that question is that function, and this is how it works in nature and how it works in the laboratory, is that novelty, that innovative chemistry is already there. Because proteins are like graduate students. They can do many things that biology doesn't ask of them at the current time, but they have the capability already built in. And so like a graduate student, if you don't want to be working in the lab 90 hours a week for low pay, you can go play the piano at a local bar, or you maybe you can become a financial advisor or something else. you got mul multiple capabilities that can be drawn out. Well, enzymes are just like that. And people like my friend Danny Tofik, uh, and this talk is dedicated to him this year because um, he passed away in a climbing accident not too long ago. But he did brilliant experiments to show that directed evolution could tease out these promiscuous functions. That's what we call them. They're not under selection at any time, but evolution could tease them out. And through this simple turn the crank algorithm could make uh, enzymes take on new chemistry. And he showed that for biological evolution where enzymes have taken on new functions and he was able to re recapitulate that. All right, so they gave us an idea. Why not evolve into the future where no one has ever gone before? And what new chemistry could we expect an existing protein to have the ability to do? And we, we discovered quite quickly uh, that maybe a heme protein could form reactive carbines and transfer those to a second substrate. So you've got this nice iron porphyrin functional group in billions, literally, of proteins, but no one has ever found a carbene transferase. Now, carbenes will inactivate proteins. So there was a hint that we could form the iron carbonoid, but there was no evidence that you could actually train an enzyme to transfer it to a second substrate and evolve that. Nonetheless, we gave it a try. So here's, here's, here's a lovely example that I often use. Many of my uh, colleagues at Caltech, you know, they pat me on the head and say, oh, biology is great. It's really cute. But, you know, the chemistry is limited. It's vast, but it is limited. And, and it can't do what we chemists can do. And, and just look, for example, at the CX bonds known in biology. It's a tiny fraction of the periodic chart. Carbon goes to nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and a few other things. But there's vast swaths of periodic chart, like silicon, where nature has never gone there, as far as we know. So nobody can find carbon-silicon bonds made biologically. So we decided to give that a try. Maybe we could do some chemistry with carbon-silicon bonds using carbenes. So this is known human chemistry, but uh, there are various aspects, it's very terrible in human chemistry, where you could take a silane shown below and have a carbene precursor like this uh, diazoacetate, methyl diazoacetate, form a reactive carbene and then insert that into the silicon hydrogen bond to make a new silicon carbon bond. And so there are some, the best human catalysts for enantioselective versions of this are about 40 total turnovers. And we just found a protein out in nature that does this just as well as the best Jack's paper in this topic with 97% enantio uh, excess. So, I mean, we, we have uh, already a, a great um, promiscuous activity here. It's just nature never cared about it, but she can certainly do it. And this comes from a, a cytochrome C whose native function has nothing to do with catalysis. It's super stable because it comes from a hot, salty pool in Iceland. And I didn't actually go there. I just pulled it from a database. And it's a really small thing. And you know what? It's so stable. You can even give it to a chemist. I mean, you can put it in a powder in a bottle. You don't even have to tell them it's a protein. It's just a catalyst. And it does it as well as the best human chemistry for this, this uh, particular reaction. Now, when I started talking about this at a meeting with other cytochrome C experts there, 
they sputtered, you know, one jumped up from the front row and said, ah, oh, Francis, this is, I don't get it because we all know that the coordination of this iron is completely occupied in a cytochrome C. And it was absolutely right. You know, there's a, a methionine ligand above, you know, that the heme takes care of four of the sites, but there's a, a you know, a, a methionine ligand above and a, and a histidine below. And if you roll your computer ball over the crystal structure of the protein, which was known, you can't come up with a big fat zero for the active site volume. So what's going on? Well, I'll just point out that nature does not care one whit about your calculations because this protein catalyzes this reaction and our puny way of visualizing a protein, for example, from the crystal structure, gives you no idea of what's happening dynamically or catalytically in these systems. So not only does it catalyze the reaction, but it evolves. So if you make mutations in the active site, and here was a campaign we just did for three rounds to show you could improve the activity 40 fold with just three generations of evolution to make it perfectly enantioselective and also have 40 times the activity of the best human catalyst. And that was enough to get it published in a snooty journal because nobody had ever made a bacterium that would form carbon silicon bonds until Jenny Kahn and, and Kai Chen did that. <laughs> and when it was published, actually all the reporters, none of them read my paper because it was, you know, a, a really boring chemistry paper with 130 pages of supplementary in, information that was well beyond the reporters. So they went to this science article and just, you know, went off from there. And it's a very interesting story in scientific publication because there was a lot of misunderstanding. <laughs> but I love this. If, I don't know if you can see it on your screens, but that's Captain Kirk and Dr. Spock looking for life inside of rocks. Remember the Horta episode on Star Trek. So we're, there was a lot of debate about silicon-based life. Uh, but you know, it's pretty interesting that nature can readily take on these new functions. And in just two years, we added both silicon and boron to the CX bonds of the biological world. So now if you want to do metabolic engineering and make boron and silicon containing materials, you can now do that. Let me give you another example of what evolution can do. It'll be really hard for a human being to do. And we, we took, we're now taking on problems that are central in organic synthesis and very difficult to do because there might be many side reactions or it involves active uh, transition states that are not favored. But this is what a macromolecular catalyst can do. So here we're going to make highly strained carbocycles, bicyclobutanes in a transformation completely unknown in biology and never even known to be catalyzed by iron. Kai Chen argued that he could make cyclopropenes. Now these have a double bond in the cyclopropane. So we're by cyclopropene already 56 kcals per mole of strain energy. These are hard to make enantioselectively, but a, a version of a cytochrome P450 that we made many years ago with a serine ligative uh, enzyme will take an alkyne and add the carbene across that triple bond to make the cyclopropene with perfect enantioselectivity and it evolves so you can get thousands of turnovers. And what's the trick? You just go to the refrigerator and test a lot of heme proteins until you find something with a little bit of activity and then you can turn the crank and make something that you can publish in a snooty journal. And then Kai didn't stop there. He said, okay, I've now got a double bond in the cyclopropene. Let's add another carbene across that and make the bicyclobutane. And now we're getting towards 70 kcal per mole of strain energy. Now we've got things you could put in rocket fuel. And he was able to evolve an enzyme that will transfer that, um, uh, that carbene and make those materials. And let me tell you, this is not something that's easy to do. I challenge anyone to design a catalyst that can take something 
starting from a cofactor that has absolutely no activity towards this and even other potent transition metal catalysts alone won't do this chemistry have it do something that has catalyze a reaction that has two separate transition states so enzymes are flexible and can take on different configurations and 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 handle things like this and deal with an unstable intermediate, which if it got out would immediately break down, but hold that in the active site and make a pure stereoisomer, a single stereoisomer. And so there are eight different ones for this product. It can make a single one and which no human chemist can do. But the protein is very happy to do it and it does it inside of E. coli for the price of sugar. And this just, is to illustrate how powerful evolution is if you can recognize these uh, promiscuous activities of the existing proteins. Well, I, this was just a, a, a quick survey to impress on you that the power of this evolutionary process, which nature has been using, of course, for the last three plus billion years, and I, you know, we all talk about the internet of things and how everything is talking to one another. That can't hold a candle to the internet of living things in the biological world, which has been crowdsourcing, problem solving all that time, right? We think we invented all this. Nature invented it long ago, transferring DNA and information back and forth from all these living things and using evolution to explore what it takes to support and promote life. And it's going on. And if we learn how to use this process, and this is what I'm so excited about the future of molecular engineering, is that if we learn how to exploit these powerful design mechanisms that nature has invented, we have a uh, great chance to solve important problems. And I haven't talked about the applications of any of this uh, but there are many talks from me on the internet that go into the applications. I decided just to talk about the, the wonder of it all. And um, thank the, I want to end by thanking these remarkable people who come to Caltech and everybody has pointed that out. It's so all the work, you know, I just go around talking about it and getting credit. Um, it's done by the innovative things that happen here in the hands of the young people who think about, gee, what, what it would be possible. And um, so with that, I'll uh, thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you for inviting me.